Welcome to another Todd's Two Minute Tech Tip Tuesday. Brought to you by the National RV Training Academy. The largest hands-on RV training academy in America. Hey, before we get to the video, which I know this is the reason why you're here, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. That way you don't miss anything. Hit the subscribe button now. Thank you. Now, back to our Tech Tip Tuesday. Hey, this week, let's go ahead and talk about a simple way to winterize your RV. Now, we get tons of questions about, hey, we're, we're getting into the winter. Let's talk winterization. Now, because I teach techs, typically I would show the technician way. We were going to be efficient with the way that we do our winterizations. But you, the RV owner, there's a lot of steps to do that. So I'm going to talk about first my preferences. There are multiple ways uh, to winterize. Now, when I'm talking winterize, I'm, I'm really focusing in on your plumbing system, the water system. Okay, so here's the thing. You're about to put your RV up for the winter. It's going to get cold, colder than what water can actually sustain itself without freezing. And if you have water in your lines, what we're concerned about is freezing where the water expands, turns to ice, which breaks the lines. And you have to do more than what we do here in Texas, which is just simply drain the system and cross our fingers and say, please don't let it freeze for more than a day. All right, so here's the way, here's the method that I'm going to teach you. And that is, of course, to use the food grade antifreeze. Okay, food grade antifreeze. I know that there are kits out there that you can purchase in order to blow the water out of your system. And I can tell you, it's not 100% accurate. And I know in some cases that that's really the only option you have. So aside from that, because I know I'm going to get some of you that said, Todd, we RV in negative 40 degree weather and between, between trips, we have to winterize the system just to move down the road because we're foolishly driving down the road in our RV when it's below freezing. Okay. So aside from that, if you're going to put it up, okay, which means you're not RVing in the winter, you got to put it up for the winter. What I'm going to suggest is, is to use food grade antifreeze. Here's the reason why. When you blow out a system, right? The thought is, well, I'm going to have air push all the water out. Well, air will push the water until the water recedes. Once the water recedes in the line, not all the way out, but once the water recedes in the line, the air is going to go right over the top of it. And there are too many right angles, too many elbows, and quite honestly, when we get over to the tankless water heater, well, we have a spiral, okay? We're going to push that water up. It's going to get across the, the air is going to get across the water. And then when you take away the air pressure, the water is going to drain right back down. It's a learning experience for a lot of the OEMs out there who just simply let the information from the tankless water heaters go out that says, hey, you can blow it out. No, you can't, right? There's a lot of returns on those tankless water heaters. Okay, so this is how we're going to do it. And that is to put it in the food grid antifreeze, and I'm going to make it super simple. But for you, the RV owner, what you have to do is just simply prep your RV, which means we're going to take the food grid antifreeze and we're going to put it in the holding tank. Now, the thing is, is because the holding tank may be off level or something like that, you'll need an extra gallon, maybe an extra two gallons. So if you can live with spending an extra, you know, a little bit of money for a gallon or two, this is going to make it super simple. So the first thing to do is, um, the thought is, is that we're going to drain the system of water. So all RVs, the holding tanks, they're somewhere around that holding tank that you can drain the water out of the holding tank. So you're going to disconnect uh, your city water and you're going to drain your holding tank. Now, some of you, if you have a large enough RV, the holding tank, the freshwater holding tank has its own drain valve. You'd open that up. Some of you with smaller RVs, you have to go find the low point drain, which takes a while. If you have a big RV and you find the low point drain, that's not it because that's going to take forever. And quite honestly, on a big RV, the low point drain may not completely get the um, holding tank empty. So you got to look at that, find out where that is, and dump it. Now what I want you to do is get yourself a funnel and pour in. Now, if you just have a small travel trailer, say 30 foot or less, uh, typically I could do it in two gallons. But since you're going to put it in your holding tank, do three, possibly four gallons. If you got a fifth wheel... Um, from there, typically four gallons, so you need to go ahead and go to six, okay? So you're going to put that in your holding tank. You're going to be disconnected from city water. Now what you're going to do is go in and turn on your water pump, okay? And here's the hard part. You're going to go to every single water fixture you have, faucets, showers, toilets, outside showers, 
ice makers, okay? Even the tankless water heater, I'm gonna go over all that, okay? You're gonna turn on the water pump. If you have a water heater, you're gonna turn it off. Turn it off, okay? Now, if you have a tankless water heater, you're gonna turn it off. And we're gonna see if we could just simply push the food grade antifreeze through the tankless water heater. Most of the time, that works absolutely perfect. You do not need to have the tankless water heater on, but when I pump water through and I call for hot water, it should be able to go simply all the way through, okay? It's gonna come out with lower pressure, but it will work. For those of you with a tanked water heater, before you start pumping the food grade antifreeze through, you gotta empty your hold, I mean your hot water tank. This is how you do that. Again, first step, Turn off the power to your water heater. What we don't wanna mess around with is hot water. Okay, and hot water works off the 12 volt system, so go to wherever your supply line is and turn those off. If you do have a Suburban with the optional little button on the outside uh, of the water heater, turn that off as well, okay? Now, if you follow the book, what we're gonna do is it says to wait two or three hours to let that water cool down. All you have to do is just turn it off. Now, you go call for hot water. Now, when you're taking the hot water out, you do still need to be connected to shore, you know, city water. So let me back up and say, don't disconnect yet until we get the hot water out. Easy way to do that, turn off the water heater, go over to your hot water faucet, turn on the hot water faucet. Hot water's gonna come out. Now, the water heater's still off at this point, still plugged into city water. You're going to change out that hot water, cold water's gonna go in. Once there's no longer any hot water uh, coming out of the sink or even outside, um, then you've got cold water in the system. So now disconnect the water, the city water, turn off the water heater. The water heater's already turned off, turn off the hot water. It's no longer hot, okay? Now what you're gonna do is you're gonna go drain it, okay? Before you go over there, now if you've got a Suburban, you're looking at an inch and a 16th socket, if you have a newer uh, Dometic, same thing, inch and a sixteenth. If you have an older Atwood, 15 16 inch socket. Before you do all that, there's still going to be possible pressure inside that holding tank. So there's your P&T valve. Stand to the side. And now there's cold water in there. There's still pressure in there, upwards of 150 PSI. Open that P&T valve. Psh, it's going to spray out just a bit. Now, before you do that, you got to turn off the water, okay? For me to relieve the pressure of my water heater, I've got to turn off the supply line, okay? My PNT valve is located up at the top of my water heater, and I'm going to open it up, and either a little bit of pressure, a little bit of water will come out. <clears throat> now pressure is equalized on both sides, okay? So for those of you with a tanked water heater, turn off the power. You're going to open up. You're still going to be plugged into short, uh, city water. Open up a hot water faucet until the water is no longer hot. Turn it off. Now go outside and turn off the city water. Okay, now we gotta depressurize it. Stand to the side and open up the PNT valve. Okay, so no water's on, no power is on. We open that up. Now we break out our socket, one and one sixteenth for both a Suburban uh, and a newer Dometic. Uh, 15 sixteenths for the older uh, Atwood. Drain blood, boom, drain it. Okay, depending on your system at this point, depending on your system, if you have a wet base system with a lever that says uh, for you to put it in winterization, go ahead and turn it to winterization. If you don't have a wet base system, you have to find where your water heater is, the back side of it, and you're going to have these little uh, shutoff valves, okay? And you need to put it in the winterization. Now, when we're looking at shutoff valves, just a rule of thumb, the handle, the position of the handle tells you the direction of the flow of water. So if your handle is parallel with the lines, you want to turn it perpendicular, okay, at this point. We want to drain it. We don't want to put any food grade antifreeze in there. Why? Well, that's six to 10 gallons, and that's just wasting money. If I can isolate it by shutting the water off both to the inlet and to the output, shut off both of those systems, and if I can drain it, then I just have an empty tank. Perfect for winterization, okay? So again, if you have a wet-based system, psh, put it in uh, bypass mode, boom, put it in winterization mode, okay? Because next, when we start pumping the food grade antifreeze, I wanna bypass the water heater. Cold water goes through a bypass line up to the hot water lines and pushes out 
the water in the hot water lens. That's our goal. Okay. So again, if we have that system set up with a tanked water heater, we've basically isolated it and taken it offline. And we're going to leave it that way. We're going to drain it and we're going to leave it that way. Okay. If you have a tankless water heater, okay, you're going to turn off the power to it. Okay. That's all that you have to do. It's just such a small amount, a little reservoir or something like that. Half gallon at most is all you're going to run through there. Um, again, I do not recommend um, uh, trying to blow the air out. Some models, you may have to buy, do the same bypass, get on the backside and um, drain it out. But here's the thing. If we can get food grade antifreeze through there, we've protected it. So how do we do that? Well, again, go over to the water pump, turn the water pump on. Now go to every single faucet. Okay, let's start off in the sink, sink in the kitchen, open up the cold water side and let the water drain out. Once the water turns pink, at least from that sink back to the water pump, you've just protected it. Turn off the cold water. Now do the hot water. If hot water comes, or if water comes flowing out on the hot water side, uh, regardless of your tank, then you're properly set. If you have a tank, you've just bypassed the uh, water heater. If you have a tankless, and water pressure starts coming out, you're properly now pushing the food grade antifreeze through the tankless water heater. Again, do that on the faucet until it turns pink. Now, when you do that, the pink stuff's gonna get into that P-trap. That's what we want. Now you gotta go to every fixture. Hear me out, every fixture. Cold water first, then hot water. Uh, flush the toilet, especially if you have um, a RV style toilet. There is a little, um, valve on the back, a little reservoir on the back. And now it's for anti-siphoning so we don't get our dirty water in with the clean water. So anyway, there's a little reservoir on the back. It's an anti-siphon device. You gotta flush the toilet till the pink stuff. By the way, you wanna leave some pink stuff. If you have a toilet ring seal down at the bottom, you want that to have some type of liquid on it. You don't want it to sit there all dried out. So halfway press on the lever, and allow the water to come through. Now, once water goes through, let all that out, close it back, halfway pressed down where you have nothing but pink stuff sitting on top of the toilet ring, okay? That pink stuff will help keep the seal, the rubber seal from drying out while you're not using the RV, okay? Washing machine, dishwasher, guess what? You wanna go ahead and buy an extra gallon of food grade antifreeze, because guess what you have to do? You have to protect those systems, so therefore you're gonna run half a cycle till you get the pink stuff in. Okay, if you're prepped for a washing machine, but you don't have one, you wanna check where your shutoff valves are and you wanna make sure you get the pink stuff up to the shutoff valve. Worst case, what you have to do is you get a little small hose on both the, I mean, on the uh, cold side hose and then where our drain is and open that up till pink stuff starts shooting out. Turn that off, take that little hose with a little half inch fitting and move it over to the hot side, turn it on till pink stuff flows through. Okay, outside showers, outside water fixtures, all of those, do not forget, cold and hot. If you have an ice maker, you have to run that stuff through, okay? Now that's simple, um, it is a little bit less efficient. You're gonna spend about two more gallons by doing this. But if you do this in the right steps, you're going to isolate everything and um, make sure you got your pink stuff. Some of you say, well, what about our black tank flush? right? There's a little hose from where we hook up our water hose back to the black tank flush. And there's typically a, a one-way valve there and it's the distance between them. Here's the thing. If you have an outside shower, you have to get the right fitting. There may have to be an adapter, but all you have to do is get a water hose with the proper adapter to hook up to the outside shower, outside sink, and then hook that hose, the other end of the hose up to your black tank flush. And whenever you turn on uh, the water, through the outside shower, you're gonna have food grade antifreeze go in and shoot through that line until it starts getting into your black tank, which is fine. You wanna dump your black tank, you wanna dump your gray tank, but at least you're putting some pink stuff in there. Now with a different hose, with a different hose, one more time with a different hose or do this beforehand, right? There's that, there's maybe that distance between where you, if you have a wet base system, where the pink stuff should go in right between the pink stuff and either your wet base system or your holding tank. So before you do the black tank flush, same thing, use the outside shower with the proper adapter, 
hook it up to your wet base system, run the system through so it's pushing the water that may be sitting in your lines between your water pump and your uh, wet base system, pushes that through, uh, or through your wet base system to your city fill. So here's the thing, you got all of that taken care of. It actually takes longer for me to say this stuff, quite honestly, than to do it, okay? Um, because honestly, it takes about 30 to 40 minutes to do this once you get used to that. Other things that you need to do, you need to properly stow away your battery. I know you've been told that all you have to do is just turn that disconnect in the off position and the battery won't get leached out. Hmm. Nothing could be further from the truth. Okay, the worst thing you do for a battery is let it sit there. If you do not have solar panels, if you cannot be plugged into shore power, you need to take the battery with you. Otherwise, when you show up after winter is over, you're gonna have a dead battery, okay? If you have solar panels, you don't need too many hours a day. Make sure all 12 volts are off. Make sure all your 120 volts are off, okay? And let the solar panel slowly keep a charge uh, on that battery. Doesn't matter what type of battery it is, the solar panel will do its thing. Now, if you have lithium batteries, if you have lithium batteries and it's super cold, if they have an on-off feature, turn it off, okay? Turn it off. Lithium batteries don't self-discharge nearly at the rate that a lead-acid gel or AGM battery does, and chances are after two or three months, you're still gonna have next to full power, okay? Here's the thing. Lithium doesn't charge well, listen to me, charge well in freezing weather. Now, it should never have to be charged too much if there's nothing on, okay? If you don't have an on-off feature and you can't physically take those batteries out, turn off everything. If you do have a solar panel, if you can go to your solar controller and lower the charge rate down to two or three amps. If you can limit the charge rate uh, from your solar controller to your ba uh, lithium batteries, you can leave those in there as well. I know it's a lot of information, but here's the thing, it's on video. Rewind it, watch it again. Okay, rewind it, watch it again, write it down. This stuff's free, so I don't have like this detailed chart. I know that you're gonna say, can you just build a chart and put it out there? Okay, eh, I could. Or you can come to class here at the National RV Training Academy and get it all right there. All right, now here's the thing. A um, Couple other things, I know that depending on where you're actually RVing, I will tell you one of the worst things you can do is just let that RV sit there, you know, uh, through extreme weather. But I understand that a lot of you, you have to um, uh, put it up. And if you can't put it under shade somewhere inside a building or something like that, then you want to button everything up, make sure all the windows and doors are closed. Don't let the insects come in. Well, if it's going to be really cold, there's probably no insects. Don't let any critters come in. How about that? Don't let any critters come in. And spend an extra day whenever you do dewinterize to go ahead and sanitize the system. Got plenty of videos on that. Maybe I'll do one again. There's your tech tip. All right, before you get to the bloopers, which is why you're here in the first place, the RV industry needs thousands of RV technicians and inspectors, and now is the perfect time to do that. If you want to make more money or have more control over your time, go ahead and click the link below. Or if you just wanna learn how to fix your own RV, got something for you there. Head over to rvtechcourse.com and get started today. Now for the reason that you're out there in the video, roll the bloopers. All right. Simple way to go ahead and winterize your RV. Hey, let's do that again, because I didn't even know what the hell I was going to talk about. Um, I'm going to say to use the... Use the words that are not coming into my mouth. So, if you have a toilet, guess what you got to do? And why should I say, if you have a toilet? What RV doesn't have a toilet? <coughs> a tent? All right, so anyway. It is hot in here. They turn off the air conditioner. It's winter outside, but it's hot. See, I got all these LED lights on. It's freaking hot.